Welcome to History at the OK Corral. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, leave us a comment down below, and share this episode with a fellow history lover. And now, on to tonight's episode. Bastrop, Texas, February 24th, 1839. In the late winter chill of a placid evening, the citizens of this small village east of Austin find themselves largely engaged with chores and preparations for evening meals. While Texas is an independent republic, having established its independence from Mexico in the Texas Revolution of 1836, it is still a slaveholding territory. Several of the wealthier citizens of Bastrop are slave owners, and thus many of the local inhabitants are slaves, subject to the dehumanizing effects of chattel servitude, even here on the bleeding edges of Western civilization's westernmost expansion. Adding to the cultural milieu that is commonplace here in 1830s Texas are several Kichi natives, as well as Tejano citizens, native Texans of Hispanic descent. Though all are subject to the stratified racial and economic hierarchy of early 19th century America, here on the Texas frontier, they live under the auspices of a singular fear that is shared by all. That of the incessant, horrifically violent raiding being carried out all across the Texas frontier by the dreaded lords of the Southern Plains, the Comanche. Time and time again in the preceding decade, Texas settlers found themselves subject to acts of violence and degradation that had scarcely, if ever, been seen by their predecessors east of the Mississippi. Countless homesteads across the Texas frontier had been laid waste to, with entire families killed or carried off into slavery. Torture killings were common, as were all manner of assaults, including sexual and otherwise. The attacks did not discriminate by race, gender, social class, religious affiliation, nationality, nor age. The Apache, the Tonkawa, the Karankawa, the Spanish, and the Mexicans who have inhabited Texas since the early 18th century have all fallen victim to the Comanche. The inhabitants of Central Texas in 1839 are but the latest iteration of a people living on the fringes of what had come to be known to the Spanish as Comancheria. The threat of raiding is in fact so pervasive that the town of Bastrop has its own warning system, instituted by Texas Ranger, Texas Revolution veteran, and Texas Army Chief of Staff, Colonel Edward Burleson. In the event of a Comanche raiding party being sighted, citizens are instructed to sound off with a long retort from a bugle-like brass horn, followed by two gunshots in rapid succession. Upon hearing this, the neighboring homestead is to repeat the signal until it reaches the vicinity of the town of Bastrop itself. Here, a small cannon will be fired, serving as the call for the local men to muster and prepare for a Comanche attack. However, as the hue of dusk begins to settle over the city of Bastrop and its surrounding farms and plantations, the threat of Comanche violence seems a world away. Then, suddenly, just as most of the town's inhabitants are getting ready to settle in for their evening meal, the high-pitched, monotone intonations of a bugle can be heard in the distance, followed quickly by two gunshots. Less than a minute later, even nearer to the center of town, the same piercing retort of a bugle, followed by two gunshots, can be heard. Moments later, the cacophonous rumble of a small cannon can be heard roaring from the center of town. The Comanche, it seems, have struck again. As the fighting age men assemble in the town square, word quickly circulates as to the cause of the alarm. A local family, the Colemans, have been attacked. Though not necessarily unique on the Texas frontier, the story that now spreads like wildfire through the town of Bastrop is sickeningly violent and demonstrative of the extremely violent, often macabre nature of Comanche raids in Texas. A combined force of Caddo, Waco, and Comanche raiders had struck the homestead of Elizabeth Coleman, a recently widowed mother, and her five children. Her eldest son James had been out in the Coleman's fields with a family friend named James Rogers, plowing rows for spring crops. They had been the first to be set upon by the Comanche, who cut them off from retreat to the family cabin. The two young men had made their escape through a thickly forested area, but would be too late in securing help for their loved ones. Minutes after abandoning the chase for Rogers and James Coleman, the large force of native warriors fell upon Elizabeth Coleman and her four younger children. Elizabeth and the children had been in front of the Coleman's family cabin, working in the garden situated roughly 50 yards from the door. Suddenly, the young mother and her children saw the blood-curdling sight of several hundred native warriors charging towards them at full speed. 
Elizabeth Coleman had screamed for the children to flee to the cabin, and all but the youngest, five-year-old Thomas Coleman, had been able to make it. Thomas Coleman, however, was swooped up violently by a warrior on horseback. Seeing this, Elizabeth Coleman had turned course and attempted to help her youngest son. Within seconds of instinctually whirling about in order to pursue her captured child, she had been struck in the throat by an arrow. She had fled back to the cabin, making it through the door and helping her 12-year-old son, Albert Coleman, bar the door to prevent the attacking warriors, now dismounted and assaulting the front door, from gaining entry. Elizabeth had then collapsed, mortally wounded, as Albert Coleman gathered the three guns kept at the cabin. Amidst the shrieks of his siblings and the dire condition of his mother, 12-year-old Albert had put up a truly unbelievable fight against the Comanche and their native allies. He fired upon any warrior who managed to breach the door, killing one outright and wounding another. He then raised one of the cabin's floorboards and instructed his younger siblings to hide underneath them and to not make a sound until they heard voices speaking in English. The preteen boy then continued reloading and firing his weapons, pouring out such voluminous fire that the attacking warriors assumed there to be several grown men defending the cabin. Finally, however, young Albert was fatally wounded by a shot from one of the attacking warriors. With his last breaths, he reiterated his instructions to his siblings hidden beneath the floorboards before finally collapsing near the body of his mother. The attacking party of Comanche and their allies had then taken the young Thomas Coleman and carried their attack on to the neighboring farmstead of one Dr. Joseph Robertson. Robertson and his family were not home. However, there were several unfortunate slaves who, without access to firearms, were unable to proffer any kind of defense. Seven of them were summarily taken away by the attacking native forces, destined for lives as slaves amongst the Comanche and their allies. It would be late in the afternoon, several hours after the attack, that a young neighbor of the Colemans named John D. Anderson found the farm said to be curiously silent and devoid of activity. He had been the first to discover the grisly scene at the Coleman cabin, and had managed to rescue the two youngest children hidden under the floorboards. From here, realizing the danger all three of them were now in, Anderson had set the youngsters astride his horse and made a mad dash to Wells Fort roughly 12 miles to the west. From here, the children were placed under a guard and runners were sent out to the surrounding towns. These runners alerted the first homestead they had arrived at, initiating the chain of warning shots that now cuts through the air in Bastrop. The men from Bastrop and other surrounding counties coalesced their forces at Wells Fort. While gathered at the fort, Jacob Burleson, brother of the famed Colonel Edward Burleson, is elected to take command. Jacob Burleson and his company of rangers and ad hoc volunteers begin searching the area for the Comanche war party they know to be close by. The search continues into the night and into the next morning when finally, at about 10 a.m., the large raiding party is spotted near what is known as Post Oak Island, located roughly four miles north of Brushy Creek. Though much of the popular lore surrounding such encounters on the Texas frontier is centered on the actual combat, the biggest problem encountered by the Texans combating the Comanche and other native tribes was actually finding their adversary on the vast expanses of this seemingly endless landscape. With this foremost task now accomplished, the Texians pursue their quarry at full gallop. And a classic Comanche tactic, still relatively unknown to their Anglo adversaries in the 1830s, the Comanche now feign a full-scale retreat. The Comanche and their allies make a mad dash for a thickly wooded thicket, while the Texians, starting roughly from a half a mile behind, pursue them in a zigzag course, aiming to cut off any additional path of retreat. As the Texians proceed to within rifle range of the Comanche, they dismount and form a battle line. While this practice was common in the eastern woodlands, here on the open expanses of Texas, it is perhaps the biggest tactical blunder that can be made. As soon as the rangers and volunteers' boots are on the ground, the Comanche and their allies immediately turn their ponies and make a headlong attack at the now footbound Texians. This catches the Texians off guard and sends the line of men scattering towards their own horses. One of the young rangers, a man by the name of W.S. Wallace, sees his horse panic and race off towards the Comanche lines, instantly becoming a trophy for the native forces. 
now on foot and helpless, Wallace makes a sprint in the direction of his comrades, in a desperate bid to escape. Seeing the dire straits of his compatriot, Captain Jack Haney turns his mount around, races back towards Wallace, and sweeps him onto his horse. The two narrowly escape a hail of Comanche arrows, which would have all but certainly resulted in grievous injury or death. Further down the Texian line, Captain Jacob Burleson, along with Franklin Highsmith and the teenaged Winslow Turner, arrive at their horses just in time to potentially evade the oncoming Comanche charge. However, in their panicked frenzy, the young Turner forgets to untie his horse, which is picketed to the ground. Seeing this, Captain Jacob Burleson turns, rushes back towards the youngster, dismounts, and unties the horse. Turner dashes off, but Jacob Burleson, just upon reaching his own horse, is struck by a gunshot in the back of his head. In the chaos of the retreat, his body is left where it falls. The rangers and volunteers now retreat, roughly three miles back towards Wells Fort, before stopping momentarily to rest their horses. As the horses rest, the rangers and volunteers descend into a malaise of anger, self-doubt, confusion, and contention. It is well known among them all that, at this very moment, the body of their countryman and comrade, Jacob Burleson, is being subject to all manner of posthumous mutilations by the Comanche, in both an effort to add literal insult to injury, as well as to hamper the person in the next life, many tribes customarily practice disfiguring the bodies of their slain enemies. The accounts of those Texas settlers who had found the bodies of their friends and family had circulated amongst every community on the frontier for many years, even at this point in the 1830s. The prevailing opinion amongst the rangers and volunteers alike is that the Comanche must be re-engaged. But the matter of exactly how to go about this presents a conundrum for the bellicose and indignant men. In the midst of contentious discussions on how to further proceed, at around noon, another force of 30 rangers and volunteers, riding under the command of Captain Jacob Burleson's brother, Colonel Edward Burleson, arrives. Informed of the death of his brother, Colonel Burleson marshals the combined forces, roughly 84 men in total, and the party makes their way back towards Brushy Creek. They ride past the Brushy Thicket, as well as the mutilated body of Jacob Burleson. Finding the thicket now empty, the Texians scan the surrounding countryside. They are met with yet another troubling, formidable sight. On the top of a large plateau near Brushy Creek, the Comanche and their allies have marshaled their forces into a large horseshoe formation, ready and waiting to receive the ranger's forthcoming charge. Colonel Edward Burleson decides that he will divide his forces. He orders one of his officers, Captain Billingsley, to lead half of the men to attack the Comanche and their allies from below the plateau, while another contingent, led by Captain Rogers, will advance up a small ravine on the backside of the plateau. However, upon arriving at their tactical destinations, both officers find themselves roughly 50 yards from the entrenched Comanche position, with nothing but a coverless no-man's land in between the two parties. Now, an entrenched, prolonged battle drags out, with each side taking shots from their positions. One Comanche warrior in particular manages to kill two Texians and wound several others, acting as a masterful sniper with his single-shot rifle. Finally, young Winslow Turner locates the warrior's position from the gun smoke rising off of his weapon. Turner manages to climb a small tree gain an advantage in position, and dispatch the sharpshooting Comanche with a carefully placed shot of his own. Finally, as the sun sets and night falls over the landscape, the Comanche and their allies retreat under cover of the night. As their enemies retreat, the rangers and volunteers are met with the haunting, visceral cries of the Comanche themselves, mourning the loss of their own beloved friends and family who have fallen that day. In the aftermath of the fight, the brutal, inhumane nature of warfare on the Texas frontier is left all too apparent to the survivors present. The rangers and volunteers now advance to the Comanche position, finding a singular survivor, one of the unnamed captured slaves taken by the Comanche the day prior. The man lies near death, with nine arrows protruding from his body in various places. He has clearly been left for dead. But the man not only miraculously survives, he is able to give testimony to Colonel Burleson that the Comanche had carried off roughly 30 of their own dead. 
the rangers and volunteers have, for their part, suffered three fatalities, including Jacob Burleson. One additional casualty, the Reverend James Gilleland, would die a little over a week later from the gunshot wound he incurred to his neck. In this world of cruelty, hardship, shifting alliances, and seemingly constant violence, the Battle of Brushy Creek provides a notable example of the multifaceted, cross-cultural, and cross-social nature of life on the Texas frontier in the 1830s. Even in the all-too-often macabre history of humanity, the tales of loss, tragedy, and survival in the history of Texas are notable in both scope and intensity. But the many tales of brutality, conflict, and cruelty that line the annals of Texas history are, for tonight, other stories for other times. Thank you for joining us on this episode of History at the OK Corral. Be sure to click the like button, share this episode with a friend, and become a subscriber. Also, if you'd like to support our work and gain early access to episodes, as well as ad-free viewing, you can become a member of this channel by clicking on the join button or click the link in the description below to become a member on Patreon. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on History at the OK Corral, home of history's greatest shootouts and showdowns.